So tonight's guest really needs no introduction. Actor, director, producer, author, songwriter, singer. Some of you may know him as Fox Mulder. Or you may recognize him from his new hit TV show, Aquarius. It is my honor to present David Duchovny. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was panicking because when I was mock signing the book, I lost the uh, page that I was going to read from. <laughs> so I'm going to have to find that at some point. But uh, I'll do a little reading uh, from the book and then uh, maybe do some question and answers uh, for a little while. And then we'll, we'll sign some books after that. Does that sound good? Sure. All right, and uh, I realize too that I'm going to need somebody to hold the book for me because I'm going to have to hold the mic or hold the mic, but not not quite at this moment, but soon. And I'm thinking of a volunteer. Uh, so this book, hi, hey, hi. This this book began as a screenplay about uh, I don't know, maybe ten years ago. We were out at our uh, uh, place that we used to go for the summers, and uh, there were a couple of guys, and this is in New England, uh, in, in Massachusetts, or Rhode Island, is Massachusetts Rhode Island? Massachusetts. And um, there were a couple of guys working up on the roof. Uh, it's an old house, and they were up there on the roof. And I heard one of them um, just say the phrase, Bucky fucking Dent. <laughs> and um, I'd never heard it before, because I'm from New York City, and and Bucky Dent was a shortstop uh, for the New York Yankees who, who hit the uh, home run that's in this book that beat the Red Sox in a one-game playoff in 1978. This book is not about baseball, I mean, mm -hmm. caution. You know. <laughs> but uh, it has some baseball in it. So anyway, so that was the first time I ever heard the phrase Bucky fucking Dent, and it just made me happy <laughs> to hear. Just, it, just to, it, it, try it when you get to a place where you can curse freely and just say it to yourself over and over and you'll, you'll be happy. <laughs> so it was, uh, and I asked the guy up on the roof, I said, you just said Bucky fucking Den? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, well, why do you say that? And he explained to me, it didn't really need that much explaining, but you know, in New England, which is where the Red Sox play, and they had uh, had many, many decades of futility uh, trying to win, trying to beat the Yankees especially, uh, Bucky Dent was this, he was the lightest hitting uh, player in the lineup. He'd had three home runs all year. And he beat the Red Sox with, with this home run. So thereafter, in, uh, in New England, he was known as Bucky fucking Dent. That's just all, you just never said Bucky Dent. It was always Bucky fucking Dent. <laughs> and um, that became, along with uh, something very personal that happened to me, the, uh, with, uh, with my, my, my daughter, actually, who got sick uh, when she was nine months old. These became the two underpinnings of the book. Well, you haven't read it yet, but you'll see. <laughs> and um, uh, these two strands came together. This idea of uh, what's, what's voiced in the book is it's never uh, Mickey Mantle that beats you. It's never, it's never the guy that you prepare for. It's never, it's never Babe Ruth. It's always Bucky fucking Dent. It's, it's the cold, the head cold that kills you, not, not the bullet, 
not not what you see, might see coming. And uh, that and the relationship uh, born of this uh, this sickness that that uh, the, the young child, which is a boy in the book, uh, has when he's nine months old, became the two kind of pillars or foundations of uh, bringing the book together. So, um, having said that, I'm going to try to find. Uh, damn it! I had it. <laughs> now I need an, need another set of hands. Uh, wonder how that's going to work. Out. <laughs> um, oh look, there it is. Okay. Um, so, do you want to hold the mic, or you want to? This is my daughter. This is West. Aww. <laughs> uh, so, so this is where um, it, um, the father, uh, Marty, is dying of cancer, and uh, his son Ted has moved in, and they they've been estranged for many, many years, and he's moved in to try to help him, not help him die, but just help him through his final, final time, and uh, Ted smokes a lot of pot. And he's a peanut bender at Yankee Stadium. Marty has just has always been staunchly anti-drug, but uh, now he's taking a bunch of uh, painkillers and things like that because he's in a lot of pain. And uh, Ted keeps on trying to get his father high on pot. You know, just, well, I thought that was funny. So um, this is the scene where he finally uh, gets his father high. So. Um, Ted turned the joint around in his mouth. I shouldn't. <laughs> this is fiction. <laughs> and you shouldn't do this ever. Say no. Or curse. Ted turned the joint around in his mouth, lit end inside as he gestured for Marty to lean in. Mouth to mouth now. Ted shotgunned a huge hit of thick smoke into his father. Marty held it in like a champ. It was the first time Ted could ever remember kissing his father. <laughs> they went through about eight containers of Chinese takeout in 20 minutes. Marty had not eaten like this in months. After finishing the last of the Mugu Gai Pan, Marty belched and said, When's it going to kick in? Which they both found hysterical. Marty stared at the joint in his hand, rotating it, appreciating it. Where do they hide this stuff? It's fantastic. <laughs> they don't hide it, Dad. Marvelous, marvelous. Get me the phone. I want to tell the world about it. The world knows, Dad. Can I have more? Should I have more? Does it just keep getting better? Not necessarily. Pace yourself. Ah, yes. Pace. The old pace. Can I have ice cream then? I'm thinking that ice cream is a good idea. Ice cream is an excellent idea. Ted went to the fridge, pulled a quart, and handed it to Marty with a spoon. Marty stared, uncomprehending, at the container. The ice cream you want is on the inside of that carton, Dad. Fusion Galaja. Fusion Galaja. That's right. Fusion Galaja. What does it mean? You know what it means, Dad. You made up shit like that yourself. It means to sound like ice cream in a fake Nordic language conjuring blonde images of tasty Scandinavian deliciousness. It fucking works, too. Hand it over. What flavor is that? Cold? Cold is not a flavor. I meant, what does any of it mean? Amen, brother. Ted, right here. Don't ever let me be without marijuana again. <laughs> Okay, Dad, got it. Solemn oath, solemn oath. And Ted, still here, I can't feel my arm. That's cool, I can see it. It's there, very near your shoulder, just below it. No, it's fucking fantastic. My arm usually throbs like a motherfucker, and now it's just floating there on cotton candy. You know your name after Ted Williams, right? Greatest hitter of all time, Teddy Ballgame, the splendid splinter. I'm aware. Frozen <laughs> Glaja. Hagen das Both names of ice creams. Carl Yastrzemski. Harmon Killerbrew. Both baseball players. You must give me all your marijuana. I am opening the gate. I am walking through the gate. Gateway. Give me that reefer back. Reefer? 
Really? We're back in the 50s all of a sudden. Look at you. You want it all. Don't want to share, you Bogart. Humphrey Bogart. Actor. Smoker. No. I must have all your marijuana because my reality sucks. Ergo, why remain in it? While you, on the other hand, must not have any marijuana because old as you are, you have not yet made your true reality. Ergo, you are running from something that does not exist. And regardless, if you created your reality, you might find it good negating the need to escape from it through the use of marijuana. Besides, if your reality, when you finally created it, turned out to actually be not so good, God forbid, then you could come to me. Why? Because I would have all the marijuana, and I would gladly share your marijuana back with me. I'm exhausted. <laughs> what? Wow. Okay, you win. All the marijuana goes to you. Marty held the joint up for close inspection. Where have you been all my life? When the student is ready, the master appears. Marty nodded at the old profundity as if it were new. Ted remembered something he wanted to bring up. Hey, you know, I want to tell you that I'm almost finished reading your novel, and I think it's really fine. It's not. It is. It's really good. I like how you constantly shift the storytelling POV from first to third person. Puts the reader on an easy ground, like a Dylan song, like Tangled Up in Blue. Can't wait to see what happens with the crazy Doubleman, man. It's not a novel. What do you mean it's not a novel? It's a journal, Ted, from my life of that time, not fiction. I just made it look like a novel and threw in some curveballs so your mother, in case she found it, would get off my back, the snoop. She should have worked for the CIA. Maybe she did. Ted was stunned, absolutely stunned. He felt at once like he'd lost his high and that he was higher than he'd ever been. A journal? You mean it's all true about this Maria woman? Marty did not answer, which was as good as a confirmation. Did you love her? What does the book say? Why didn't you leave then? Why didn't you leave for her? Because it wasn't right. Men don't leave. They die. Instead, I really got into the socks. What? I didn't give a fuck about baseball, Ted. I mean, I liked it, sure. But what kind of man roots for a team like it's life and death? I just found that if I acted crazy enough about the socks, your mother would leave me alone when I was watching a game or reading the paper, whatever. I could be elsewhere for years. Whenever the socks were on, I could disappear. And when I disappeared, I didn't miss her so badly. I don't even know where to begin asking questions. Then don't. So the whole baseball thing is a lie? What do you mean a lie? Something that is not true, Dad. I guess if you want to be literal, start out that way. And then as time passed, I didn't think about Maria that much anymore. I just thought about the socks. She became the socks and the socks became her. I don't know how to put it in words. It was like Maria disappeared into the socks and didn't really exist for me anymore, it existed in a way that didn't hurt so much anyway. So you checked out of both worlds, hers and ours. Making a choice was wrong. Not making a choice was wrong. I make no apologies, son. My life was shit, and I made it that way because that's what I deserved. I was not a good man. I hate marijuana. It's a terrible drug. I'm falling asleep on my feet. I'm asleep now. I'm sleep talking. You made your life shit? Maybe that's what you deserve, Dad, but we deserve better from you. Mom and I, we deserve better. I don't want to fight. I'm not fighting, I'm just saying there's collateral damage. Stop. I need to sleep. I can't do anything for your mother, God rest her soul. I miss that both. She deserved better than what I gave her, yes, and I wish I could have told her that. I understood that while she was alive. But whatever you need or whatever you needed, can't you just make believe I'm giving it to you or I gave it to you? That's something I'm afraid you have to do for yourself at this point. Do you do that for me? Lie to me? I don't know, Dad. I'm not sure I know how to go about even starting something like that. I bet you do. Good night, Ted. May I kiss you good night? Of course. Marty walked over and kissed the top of Ted's scalp. Good boy, he said, and left to go lie down for the night. I don't hate marijuana, were his final words of the evening. Or so Ted thought until Marty popped his head back in and asked, Hey, can you take me to see that movie, The Animal House? <laughs> you want to see Animal House? Yeah, it looks good. It's not George Orwell's Animal Farm, you know, very different. Looks funny. It does? Looks like the end of the world to me. Looks like the kids have taken over. Looks funny to me. I like that Chevy Chase. He's not in it. <laughs> Whatever. Still looks funny. I'll take you. We can have licorice and popcorn. Good night. And this time he left and stayed gone. Ted remained seated at the kitchen table, marveling at how big the emptiness inside him felt and how the smallest thing, a sideways word from his father, could tear it open 
and how the smallest thing, a kiss from his father, stitched it up in light. Ted wondered how he could hold on to that feeling of being kissed, even as the feeling faded. He reached for more frozen glaja. <laughs>